Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this episode in the ITU AI and Machine and 5G Challenge webinar series. Thank you very much for joining today. My name is Thomas Baskolo from the ITU, and it is my privilege to introduce today's webinar. The AI and Machine 5G Challenge is organized by the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, which is the United Nations Agency for ICTs. The challenge aims to create a community that will solve network-related problems using AI and machine learning. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to go through a couple of house housekeeping rules. On the bottom panel of your screen, you'll find two icons uh, named chat and Q&A. If you have a question, please use the Q&A window, type it in the Q&A. For anything else, please use the chat window. Make sure that when you're using the chat window, you set it to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see the message. Also note that your microphone is disabled, so you, are not, you cannot be allowed to talk during the webinar, but you can use these uh, functionalities that I've just mentioned before. I would also like to inform you that today's presentation is going to take between 30 and 40 minutes and is being recorded. We are going to provide the presentation slides as well as the recording on the website, on the event website that uh, you used for registration. We are looking forward to your active and interactive participation. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, today's webinar or today's talk is going to be given by Francis Fuhemi. Uh, Frank holds a PhD in Information and Communication Technologies uh, from UPF uh, in, in Spain. Previously, he obtained a BSc in Telematics Engineering and a Master's in Intelligent and Inter Interactive Systems also from UPF. Currently, Frank is working as a postdoctoral researcher in Mobile Networks Department uh, of the Te Telecommunications Technological Center of Catalonia, T uh, CTTC. He's also involved in the standardization of future uh, standardization activities within the ITUT, uh, namely in the focus group on machine learning for future networks, including 5G. Uh, he acted as an editor, a mentor of student projects, and of course, last year or so through the challenge, he organized a problem statement that was one of the successful problem statements uh, for the challenge. In today's talk, uh, Frank will provide an overview of both IEEE WLAN 11AX and 11BE special reuse mechanisms and discuss two problem statements that he has proposed for this year's challenge. In this challenge or in these problem statements, participants uh, must harness the potential of machine learning to solve the relevant problems in communication, such as special reuse one. So at this moment, I would like to welcome Frank. Uh, hello, Frank, and good afternoon. Hello, Thomas, and hello to everyone. So how are you today? I'm fine. Thank you a lot. <laughs> Hope you too. Yeah, so the floor is yours. Uh, please, you can start the presentation. Okay, thank you a lot. And thanks to, to everyone who is here. I'm, I'm super glad to, to introduce you a topic which is special reuse in, in Wi-Fi networks. And also to present two different uh, problem statements that will be presented uh, to, to, to this uh, ITU AI challenge in this uh, this year's edition, 21 edition. So let me share my screen and let's begin with the presentation. <clears throat> okay, so there we go. Okay. So as Thomas said, my name is Frances Wilhelmi. I work at CTTC now, but today I am going to present two problem statements for the ITUA challenge. And this is a collaboration with uh, my former uh, organization, which, which is the UPF, Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, Spain. And to do that, 
first of all, I will introduce you this um, this topic that I said, which is special reuse in IEEE uh, .11 wireless lamps in Wi-Fi. Before I start, uh, I wanted to, to 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 talk a little bit about the the 2020 edition, uh, where we uh, also provided a problem statement in the context of of Wi-Fi networks, but differently from this year. Uh, last year, what we focused on was on on the channel bonding uh, problem in in Wi-Fi. Uh, just to, to summarize, we had five teams. Three of them uh, made it to, to, to get to the final. Uh, in these teams, we had uh, both students and professionals. And fortunately, one of these teams uh, was able to, to win uh, a prize. So this year, we, we hope to, to do the same. And during the lifetime of the last year's edition, we had several activities uh, like webinars, hands-on. Uh, uh, we had calls uh, with uh, to, to provide personal feedback. We had many, many activities. And at the end of the channel, of the challenge, which uh, to me it was uh, very, very successful because we, we made a lot of things. Uh, participants proposed um, very, very interesting uh, models to, to address this problem in particular. <coughs> Excuse me. And in the end of the challenge, uh, we could submit a joint contribution to, to ITU Journal, which is the, this paper that you see here where uh, members from all the teams, so we have we had teams from uh, all the world, and uh, these members were invited to, to submit uh, or to, to participate in this publication. And this year we want to do the same. If you have um, interest or you have uh, doubts on, about the, the challenge that we did last year, here you have the website. You can access to it and, and see all the details of, of this uh, problem statement in particular, which was uh, on, on channel bonding in Wi-Fi. So now uh, I will go directly to, to the special reuse topic. Um, OK, uh, so this is one of the mechanisms that uh, has been introduced in, in Wi-Fi amendments in order to address uh, the, the, the problems associated to, to density in Wi-Fi networks. It, I, I think this is a good uh, categorization of, of the kind of mechanisms that we have in, in Wi-Fi and in general in, in, in telecommunications. Uh, we have solutions on, on the time domain, like a scheduling or contention window adaptation in, in Wi-Fi and this kind of mechanisms in, in time. We also have mechanisms in frequency, like dynamic spectrum access, dynamic channel bonding, uh, OFDMA, and, you know, in the frequency domain. And in the spatial domain, in the space, we have apart from directional transmissions, uh, which can be beamforming or interference can cancellation through, through MIMO. We also find uh, transmit power control and sensitivity adjustment. So here uh, with these two kind of mechanisms is where we find uh, special regions. And SR, what it aims from the point of view of the network is to <clears throat> increase the utilization of the spectrum. So with that, what it is solved is to improve efficiency. And to do that, what it likes to do is uh, yeah, to increase the, the, the number of transmissions that are being held in parallel in a given uh, network. From the point of view of the user, what we have or 
what we want to do is to increase the, the number of TF jobs so that the user can transmit more often. And this, uh, of course, is uh, done in order to improve throughput or reduce delay, latency, and so on. <coughs> Okay, before I proceed, I think it is important to, to clarify a little bit uh, what the CCA threshold is and how it is used in the context of CSMA CA operation. So basically, CSMA CA is the protocol that uh, is mostly adopted in, in Wi Fi networks for accessing to the medium in a distributed manner. So we have several devices that operate in the same frequency band because the, in Wi-Fi we have uh, the licensed uh, frequency bands and that can be used uh, by everyone. So <clears throat> in order to coordinate all these transmitters, what we do is to apply this protocol. And the protocol, in order to allow for a transmission in, at a given moment, what it does is to implement a decreasing backoff procedure. And once the backoff is, uh, is finished, then the, 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 the device that is uh, performing this backoff is allowed to transmit. But of course, during this countdown, so as, as, as long as the backoff is being decreased, you have to listen to the channel. And if at any point, you sense that there is a, another ongoing transmission in the channel, then you have to stop. <clears throat> you have to stop your back off. So you are not allowed to transmit or to attempt to transmit until this ongoing transmission is, is finished. And to determine whether we find the channel busy or idle, what we use is this uh, CCA mechanism. So basically we apply a threshold that given a Wi-Fi signal uh, allows us to determine whether the, the channel is free or busy. So if we detect a signal above this threshold, this CCA threshold, then we have to stop our, our back off and, and don't transmit. So be quiet until uh, the, the, this ongoing transmission is, is finished. In opposite, if we detect a signal, but this signal is, uh, you know, is low, it's not strong enough. So <clears throat> it, it falls below the CCA threshold, then we are allowed to transmit, to continue our back off and to transmit. <clears throat> and with that, I can uh, show you a little bit what are the implications of, of tuning the, the transmission power and the sensitivity? In this animation, we, we only refer to the transmit power. And, you know, we, we do this because uh, special for you, the SAR is based on the X power adjustment and sensitivity adjustment. So here, <coughs> at the beginning of the animation, uh, we have a very low power that it is not enough to, to allow transmission between uh, this access point A, which in this case is the one that is transmitting, and the destination, which is the station. So if the power is very low, uh, we are not able to reach our destination. So this is something that is very clear. At the same time, if the power is low, we are not affecting to, to other devices in, in the neighborhood. So if there are devices uh, within the same area and we use a low, a low power, then uh, we are not generating an excessive interference that may lead to problems in, in the other devices. So what it is optimal in these uh, kind of scenarios is to use the appropriate transmit power level so that you are able to transmit to, to the station, but you are not generating interference to the others. So 
if your transmit power is very, very high, uh, your transmission to, to this station will be successful, but other devices may be affected by your transmission. Similarly, with the sensitivity, what we are tuning is the, the area of, of, of that, that a given device can listen to. So if the CCA is very, very low, like minus 82 dBm, then the listening area is high, is, is large, as we can see now. If this area is, is, is big, then the devices that fall into this area and <clears throat> that can potentially generate starvation increases. So we have more devices that if they transmit, we need to contain um, for our transmission. So we cannot transmit if some of these devices is transmitting. Uh, but of course, if you use a sensitivity that is very, very high, then you are in danger of uh, not listening to the devices that you want to listen. So in this case, this uh, station A, which is the one that needs to, 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 to have a communication with uh, access point A, if the sensitivity of access point A is too, too high, is very high, then the packet sent by, by this station will not be able to, to, to reach the access point A. So here again, we have a trade-off between the, the, the number of devices that are within this listening area and the devices that we are interested to be there. So uh, to find the optimal uh, sensitivity level, CCA threshold, uh, the optimal would be that uh, we still listen this station, so this is green, and we don't have interactions with other devices, so this is green too. <clears throat> in in a standard 11AX, which was the, the first to introduce this kind of mechanisms, we have a special reuse. And in particular, we have two different mechanisms to achieve this uh, special reuse operation, which is based on sensitivity adjustment and transmit power control. So what I just uh, overviewed, uh, these are the formations of these uh, two mechanisms. One is, it is called OVSSPD based SR, and the other is PSR. <coughs> And just to show you an example of, of how this works, uh, simply uh, when a device, uh, namely here, APA detect, is detecting a transmission from uh, a different device from a different VSS, in this case, APB, uh, the access point in this case will um, decode the preamble of this transmission, of this um, high efficiency PPDU. This is the nomenclature for 11AX uh, data frames. So <clears throat> after you know detecting this uh, preamble of the transmission and provided that, that the, the, the power sensed from this AP is below uh, a given threshold, uh, which is called OVSSPD threshold, then this is an indicator to, to mark the, the channel as, as free. So um, just to put you in situation, if we don't have a special reuse, um, when APB is transmitting, then APA will sense the channel busy, so it will not be able to transmit simultaneously. However, with a special reuse and the proper uh, OBSSP threshold, when APB transmits, then APA is able to, to, to ignore that transmission and transmit in parallel as you can see here. Okay. 
when it comes to uh, standard 11BE, which is the, the standard that is uh, <clears throat> expected to, 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 to be released in, in four years approximately, this is then the, the new generation of uh, .11 amendments. In, 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 in this family of standards, what we will have is uh, multi-access point coordination, which I think is the main novelty besides using the, the six gigahertz band and, and some other features. But one of the most important novelties that is being at uh, this moment at, at this 11B amendment is multi-access point coordination. And multi-AP coordination, what allows to, is to evolve special reuse uh, and, 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 you know, and perform a special reuse in a coordinated manner. At this moment, uh, I'm aware that there are two main proposals for special reuse in this 11B amendment. One is CSR, and the other one is PSR, which is the other mechanism included in the 11AX that uh, I didn't explain, but which is similar to, to the one that I explained, OBS SPD special reuse, but uh, here uh, what the, they propose to include is to combine this PSR operation with beam forming and null steering. But as far as I'm concerned, the, the mechanism that is uh, winning this competition, so that the one that it seems that will be finally included in the amendment is CSR. So more efforts are being put at uh, this moment in CSR. And in CSR, basically we have the same as before. So we want to, to adjust the, the sensitivity threshold and, and the transmit power that we use. But in this case, we do it uh, in a coordinated manner. So by uh, providing coordination, what we can do is to improve even more the quality of the transmissions that are being uh, held in parallel. Because, you know, in 11AX, uh, everything is decentralized. This is a decentralized mechanism. And here we have coordination. So this is useful, as you will see now, to, to improve the performance of this uh, mechanism. Uh, here, uh, just to put an example of how this works, we, uh, I also have two devices that um, are transmitting uh, over time. First of all, we have a preparation phase where um, all the devices, um, you know, gather information from, from stations, from, from measurements, and, you know, um, for instance, the interference generated to different stations and the power of level sensed by other devices from other VSSs and so on. So during the preparation phase, uh, we accumulate knowledge about the, the, the network, the scenario that we will use uh, later for the, the, the coordinated transmissions. Then we have a setup phase uh, just to, for instance, uh, clarify the role of each access point or which are the, the links that are allowed to, to, to coexist in, in the same time and so on. And finally, during communication, uh, there is one access point that is taking the leadership, like here in this case, access point A, which transmits at legal frame indicating that it is going to transmit and also that APB is allowed to transmit simultaneously, but with some conditions. Like for instance, APA is announcing that it is going to transmit to some device, for instance, a station associated to this AP, and that it allows APB to transmit to another different station, uh, this time associated to APB, and with a 
a given maximum transmit power so that the transmission from B does not affect to, to the transmission of A. And this is, um, you know, this kind of information uh, is um, derived or obtained by the measurements that were done in the preparation phase. At this moment, you know, this is an ongoing specification. This has not been defined completely, but some of the most important discussion points on, on this are whether to extend this operation to the uplink, because with um, uh, at this moment, this is downlink. So the AP, the APs are the ones who are transmitting to stations. But how to extend this to the uplink is a uh, more challenging because APs have more control than stations. Also, how to perform the measurement phase, which is the overhead associated to this. How often do you need to measure this kind of stuff? Then how OSDMA will be integrated in this. So one potential usage of OSDMA is for the block acknowledgement frames so that we don't have collisions in, in block ACKs. And also maybe how to <clears throat> define optimization goals to, to, to perform this. Okay, and here uh, I just wanted to show you um, in practice how this works. So I have um, two little scenarios that we used uh, to perform some simulations. In the first scenario, it makes sense to apply a special reuse because you know we have two different blocks of devices. Uh, this is wrong, this is AP2. But we have two different blocks of devices, so two BSSs that are uh, independent enough of each other and they are separated enough in order to allow this kind of simultaneous transmissions. And we have another scenario where a special reuse is not uh, the, the best option. Uh, you will see why now. So in the first kind of deployment, which here you have the results, of the aggregate performance in case of using the default transmission power and the full sensitivity mechanism, so the CCA mechanism. Uh, these two APs put sense to each other and would not be able to transmit simultaneously. If you use uh, 11AX or VSSPD special reuse with the appropriate threshold, in this case, minus 72, DVMs, then you allow these two APs to, to transmit simultaneously. Even if uh, one is occupying the channel, the other um, will ignore that uh, the other's transmission and transmit in parallel. In this case, the interference uh, from the other AP is not enough to, you know, to to generate uh, collisions in, in the destinations, in this case, the stations. And in this same scenario, if we apply coordinated special reuse, we are able to optimize even more the performance because we are able to set the transmit power level that is optimal in, in, any, in any case, okay? Because we have the information of the of the interference generated by by each device, so we apply the the transmit power that is the best. And in this in deployment two, this this deployment below, uh, here the best is not to apply special reuse because if you allow the transmitters AP one and AP two to transmit simultaneously, then the interference generated to to, to, to the destinations, to, to, to the stations, will be very high and, and, and it will lead to collisions. So in this case, if you apply 
um, 11 injection of special reuse, which is um, decentralized, then your performance will drop uh, significantly because of the collisions that you are generating. However, if, you know, if, if you have some kind of coordination, you are able to also identify this kind of um, worst case scenario situations and prevent to, to transmit in, in parallel. So here, basically, what these two access points do is uh, to agree that the, the best is to transmit individually. So the performance is the same as if, if you have the, the default CCA mechanism. But you know, with coordinated special reuse, you have this freedom and this kind of adaptability to improve the cases where you can improve, but not to <clears throat> suffer um, you know, these performance drops in, in other kind of situations where applying special reuse is not the, the best. And uh, I will go very brief here because, uh, you know, um, these are some results for high density deployments where large scale, large scale deployments. And here we focused on the delay. Here in each of the graphs, we have the same scenario, but with different densities. So we have more devices uh, or less depending on, on on, on the density. In all the cases, if you compare the solid with the dashed lines, you will see that uh, special reuse allows improving the delay in, in all the cases from low to high density. Okay. Okay, so as for the challenge, which uh, is about applying ML to address this problem of special reuse, um, <clears throat> just to motivate a little bit the usage of AA in communications, uh, you know, before or well nowadays too, we have um, model-based solutions where you define a model that is uh, made by hand. And this model is uh, used to, to address some, some problem. Uh, you know, for instance, a path loss model uh, can be derived from measurements. So basically you have an input, some parameters, and then you define an output based on some observations or some analysis that you perform by hand. And, and then you have a model. The problem of this approach, a model-based approach, especially in next generation communications, is that you need to, 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 to address the grade of between accuracy and tractability. You know, sometimes if your model uh, needs to be accurate for, for characterizing a given complex process, you cannot meet um, you know, uh, maybe your model is intractable. So you have that in, in, in the balance. And of course, um, so, so some, uh, another pitfall of, 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 of models often is that they lack of generalization. The, the case that I was mentioning on, on the path loss, you may drive a path loss very good for a very specific location uh, an indoor location or, or whatever. But then if you apply this path loss model to a different uh, scenario, to a different environment, uh, maybe your accuracy is, 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 is very low and, and the model does not hold for that other um, scenario. So here we find a, a lack of generalization. In contrast with data-driven, so the AI approach, uh, what you do is learning from data. Instead of uh, deriving a handcraft solution, you, you provide data to, to, to your model, and your model learns with this data. And with that, 
what we expect to do is to address this kind of complexity that we may see in, in dense deployments as the ones that I show you in special reuse, and also to adapt to, to multiple situations. Because, uh, you know, in, the, in, in, in that deployment that I show you with two BSSs, there were two different situations. One where special reuse is, uh, you know, is very useful to apply it in, in that scenario. But another scenario that can be very similar, but have some small differences, like the location of the stations. And then in that scenario, you don't, you, you know, you don't need to apply SR because it's counterproductive. So with, uh, from ML, we expect this kind of adaptability that could be granted by learning from data. And just to, to provide some context on, on the activities held by the ITU, we find uh, an ML architecture, which is a specification Y3172 that you can, you can see because it, it is open and, and, and you can uh, read it, this, uh, this architectural framework and basically it defines uh, a set of nodes and interfaces and communication processes to or for enabling the the operation of ML in, in communication systems. In wireless LANs, this is uh, the flexibility provided uh, by this uh, architectural framework is very useful because of, uh, you know, the the kind of different, um, how to say it, the, um, you know, in, in wireless lands, you may have different, different settings. And you have the centralized settings, you have coordinated settings, you have fully coordinated where you have a central entity that is controlling everything. So this kind of flexibility is useful to instantiate the different processes within the ML pipeline at different locations of the network. No. Uh, apart from that, and this is more related to, to the kind of uh, output that we want to generate with the problem statements that, that I will show you now in, in a minute, is how we can use simulators in, in this kind of closed loop ML-based optimization. So basically with simulators, we can do several things like, like testing, training, or evaluating ML models before we apply, we apply them uh, into an operative network. And in the context of this uh, challenge and the problem statements that uh, I am presenting today, is that we use uh, simulators to train uh, ML mechanisms. So, <clears throat> You know, sometimes, especially um, regarding uh, features that are still being developed at uh, this moment, like uh, it is the coordinated special reuse operation, it, it is very difficult to, to, to get data from, from real networks because uh, there are, you know, there are no devices that implement that. Oh, and even if there are devices implementing that kind of mechanism, it is very hard to, to, to get a, a complete data set um, that can be used to, to train a given ML mechanism. So instead, what we propose is to implement these mechanisms in simulators and generate data with these simulators. So we can generate multiple deployments uh, multiple situations where we apply this uh, kind of mechanisms, SR in this case, and we generate data that can be used uh, and introduced into an ML mechanism for training, right? And basically we, we do this with a simulator that we developed at the UPF and which is called Commodore. Uh, it is, everything is open source. You can go here 
and, and check it. But basically, uh, this is a simulator that we have used in, in, in many projects and in many uh, academic publications. And also we use uh, Commodore in, in the previous edition, in the 2020 edition of the AA Challenge. And just to give you a little bit of, of context, this is a simulator that we developed a few years ago in order to characterize uh, features in the 11 AJAX that were not, you know, that at that moment ha, were not being developed in other simulators like NS3 or, or, you know, Opnet or some other popular simulators that are widely accepted by the community. Uh, and that's it. As for the problem statements, I don't know how much time do I have. Uh, I will go very briefly because this is the, the idea of the problem statements. Uh, we still need to define everything, but well, basically the first problem statement is on the application of federated learning for special reuse. Basically, federated learning is a mechanism introduced by Google uh, where uh, it's a change of paradigm because the, the training is uh, performed differently uh, as, as before. So traditional models, uh, traditional learning models gather all the data into a central server or central unit and do the training there. And in, instead in federated learning, what uh, we have is uh, a fully decentralized or distributed uh, scenario where multiple uh, participants of this training procedure uh, are used in, in a very special manner. Uh, I think I, I will not go into details with this because I don't have time, but uh, just to say how we want to apply this, Basically, uh, as for the 11 AJAX special reuse mechanism, which is distributed, um, we want you know, to address this complexity of SR and find the best configuration in terms of power and sensitivity in each device or in each BSS. And through federated learning, what we aim to do is to split a big problem, which would be a, a big data set with uh, multiple interactions among devices and, and many situations, and split that into sub problems. So basically, we have uh, several deployments or several interactions that we extract from the data set. And with that, we train a, a, a federated learning model by updating you know, these uh, weights uh, in each of the deployments and then uh, improving the model based on this. Okay, and to do that, what we are going to do is to publish a data set on 11NGX SR, where you will find multiple random deployments, you know, where multiple kinds of interactions or situations can be noticed from, from the data set. And some of the features that may be of interest in, in this data set are the, the configurations of, of the devices, the interference, the, you know, the location of the devices and so on. And as labels, you can find the throughput or the delay or whatever metric that can, can be useful to, to predict. Uh, apart from that, we'll provide a general model as baseline. You know, we, we have a general model that is uh, published to, to, to every deployment. And based on the general model, you specialize uh, your, um, the, the, the feature, well, the weights and of the features in each deployment. And then you um, update the general model based on what you have experienced in, in each of the deployments. 
and uh, yeah, and the solution you know will be evaluated later. So you will propose a federated learning model to improve the general model that we will provide, and also to specialize uh, in, in each particular deployment. And then your solution will be evaluated in a test data set that we will provide later, as we did last year. And problem statement two is, is um, are a little bit different. In this case, it's for coordinated special reuse. And basically what we want to, what we want you to do is to, through machine learning or more specifically clustering or classification mechanisms, what we want you to do is to find given a given scenario the, the best combinations of, of transmitters and receivers in order to perform this coordinated special reuse operation, right? So instead of having the measurement phase that I was mentioning before, we would have this ML solution that automatically detects, given the, the picture of the deployment, which is the best, uh, which are the best combinations of, of transmitters and receivers. Again, here we'll provide a data set with uh, multiple deployments, multiple sets of transmissions. So given a, a deployment, we, we can have uh, all the possibilities of the transmissions and just for the sake of training. Uh, um, at the level of features, uh, this would be the same as before. Um, you know, uh, transmitting nodes, power, configuration, interference, uh, distances, whatever. And here you have uh, more freedom and you can propose any kind of model that switches to this particular problem. And, and that's it. And, and again, uh, the solution would be evaluated in, in a different data set that would be provided uh, afterwards. And thank you a lot for listening to me. I, I am sorry because I, I did not prepare very well the presentation and, uh, and I didn't, I wasn't aware of it at the time and I, I had to skip some things, but uh, thank, thank you a lot. And if you have any, que any question, it, it is welcome. Thanks a lot, uh, Frank, uh, for the nice presentation, introducing the two problem statements for this year's challenge. Uh, we have some few questions, and of course, I would like to request my colleague Vishnu to moderate the Q&A. So Vishnu, welcome and good evening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, thanks, Thomas. Excellent as usual. As usual, excellent presentation from Frank. There are some questions uh, in the chat, uh, in the Q and A in the chat, uh, Frank. Uh, I think let me let me go over them first, and then I have some uh, I have some questions of my own. <laughs> so the first question is uh, that uh, in slide eleven. So if you go to slide eleven, the default and the uh, CoSR have similar performance. I think uh, the reference is to the right side uh, graph, right? Uh, yeah. So, so this the yellow color graph CoSR. So yeah. the so the question is the whether the monitoring and um, and uh, the coordination does it add any uh, does it add any overhead or uh, does that um, make it uh, cumbersome? So, yeah. So the coordination, the impact of the coordination. Why we are not seeing uh, a great amount of uh, difference in the graphs? I guess that's a question. Yeah, that's a pretty good question. <laughs> uh, here we should have these kind of overheads, but we didn't model them because uh, we didn't even know which kind of overheads were going to be presented by by IEEE standards and uh, at this moment is one of the topics that is being developed in in the task group that is developing this amendment so here we just plotted the the output of the performance that would occur after all 
all the measurements and everything. So in the long term. So we just focused on, on the final picture. We didn't include overheads, just the final performance. So uh, you are completely right. The performance of co-CSR should be lower than, than the legacy mechanism, the legacy CCA mechanism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Frank. Uh, there is another one. I think um, towards uh, when you were mentioning about uh, distribution, uh, SR is distributed in 11 AX, ah, yeah. centralized in 11 BE. Yeah. But uh, when you talk about federated learning, but, but actually you talk about federated learning. So are we limiting ourselves to 11 AX? I think yes. that's the question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I apologize because uh, in this part, uh, I was very, very <laughs> quick and I could not provide details, but problem statement one, federated learning is for 11 jets, and problem statement two is uh, for 11B, co-CSR, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh... So yeah, so this coordination, yeah, I think there is uh, there is another question on this coordination. In fact, I have uh, I have the same similar question. Uh, the coordination, you know what happens in three GPP, right? There is a specific interface between uh, genome bees which exchange information. We're pretty much similar uh, for interference management. Uh, but that is that is using a specific interface, uh, X2 uh, based interface. But here you are uh, you are referring to monitoring. Is that all, or is there a message exchange expected? Uh, yeah. And if so, what is the frequency? I think that's the question. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. Um, this is not defined as well. This is something that needs to, to be defined and this is one of the the main handicaps of the of this mechanism and something that could you know blow up everything and make this uh, useless to, to say something. But um, you know in monitoring in this monitoring phase you have like two procedures like one is the AP is passively sensing the environment and gathering for information. And the other is that the AP is able to request to stations or, or other devices to share this information as well, uh, the information that they have from their own perspective, right? So how often this should take place? This is completely open. This is something that needs to be evaluated. Uh, in, in some situations, again, this should be um, something to be adapted according to the specifications or the, the you know the characteristics of the if its deployment. If there is a lot of mobility, this should happen very often. If uh, everything is quiet, like at home or an enterprise, or you know, it depends a lot of on the scenario. So in that case, uh, monitoring. Uh, it doesn't make sense to 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 do it very often. So, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, thanks, thanks, Frank. And uh, about command or there is a question which is asking about the synthetic data. What would change from one deployment to another? And from training to test data set and. Uh, uh, and uh, what is the model capacity to generalize? I guess, well, the generalization question is up to the model, I guess, but but yeah. it, could you could you take a short at the answer? Yeah, for sure. Um, the synthetic data sets, uh, we still need to, to discuss the, the exact details about how we will do that. But basically in one kind of data set, the, the first one for federated learning, we are going to focus on, on a data set where, where you have like separated deployments or separated instances of deployment so that you can perform the federated learning. This is something that we need to think about. And in the second one, CoSR, 
we will focus more on um, you know the kind of uh, static deployments uh, where we focus on all the combinations on of transmitters and receivers so the the main difference is that before we may generate multiple random deployments very different and here we may generate like a very few number of deployments and try all the combinations and, and, and so on. And the difference between the planning and test data set, you know, basically uh, what, what we did in the last edition was to provide some scenarios that were very similar to planning ones. So we had some kind of planning deployments that then in, in the test data set were somehow replicated with different characteristics, but in shape, they were very similar. And we also provided scenarios that were slightly different and very different. And we did that in order to see the capacity of generalization of the, mech, of the models that were proposed. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some models were able to generalize very well, and some others were very, very good at the scenarios that uh, were similar, but not that good in other uh, types of deployments. So we had um, solutions very different and, and very good in, in different aspects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Actually, the very next question also, uh, AP locations. In fact, I would add even the STA yeah. distributions. And even I will, I will, I will also add your traffic distributions. So, so could you could you comment on this uh, your topology and uh, STA locations and uh, yeah. traffic uh, patterns? Uh, I mean, um, later someday we can have a hands-on meeting uh, discussing all, all this kind of stuff, and I would be very delighted to <laughs> to explain details of the simulator and the data. But Yes, location of APs is fixed. And for each deployment, we may vary the, the location of stations, but not in the same simulation. So in a given simulation, we have fixed uh, stations and fixed access points. And traffic, uh, we have different models. We have UDP, uh, UDP in full buffer or with different traffic loads. So this is something that we need to check. But in my experience, in order to clearly see the kind of interactions produced by SR, the best is to use full full graphic mode. Okay. So full okay. Buffer, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And would you? What kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, collision scenarios would you simulate in the downlink? Would you? look at uh, simulating collision scenarios at all or is it just totally random the uh, transmission scheduling i mean towards the stas uh, what is the pattern i'm trying to find whether you would simulate collisions or not yeah simulations are are implicit in in in, in the simulations i mean uh, it, it depends on 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 the location of the stations and and the transmissions that are uh, being uh, held in each moment, but uh, we model collisions in the simulator. So if if, if we simulate uh, random deployments, we may have collisions or we may have not collisions. It depends on 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 the kind of deployment. I don't think we do handmade uh, scenarios where we force collisions to occur but they are prone to, to occur in, in, in many cases. Okay, thank you. And mm -hmm. there is one question in the chat window, which ah, is, yes. yeah, which is asking about uh, computing overhead, processing latency, et cetera, et cetera, especially because, uh, because these conditions change, they are volatile. So could you comment on that one? Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit beyond the, the presentation and, and, and the topic that we were talking here. But it's a good area to, to, to study. And 
in this regard, we find, uh, you know, the, the ML sandbox that I was mentioning of high utility to, to perform a staff offline and to be able to, to, to speed up uh, the, this kind of processing and, and, uh, and so on when, when models need to be applied in, in, in a network, right? But... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one, maybe a couple of last questions. Slide 24. If you go to 24, the use. Ah, yes. So here um, you're basically assume, assuming that all APs have the same data, is it? I mean, you, you, you're trying to kind of cluster it, but the assumption seems to be that. Uh, you can change the clustering, but the data is still remaining the same. Is, is that what your assumption is here? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, just to provide an example. So we may have the case where AP1 gains the, the access to the channel and decides to transmit in parallel with another AP. So at this moment, AP1 must decide uh, first of all, to which transmission, to which station it will transmit in Dublin. So here, maybe station 1.2. And also, if it allows other APs to transmit simultaneously. It may uh, allow AP2 or AP3 or both of them to transmit uh, in parallel to different stations. For instance, here, maybe the optimal could be a AP1 to transmit to a station 1.2 and AP2 to transmit to a station 2.2. If AP2 uh, would transmit to a station 1.3, for instance, uh, you know, the, the level of interference would be maybe harmful in this case. So the idea is that the clustering mechanism identifies these uh, pairs of devices that you know that work the best in a in a parallel transmission mm -hmm. um, I'm very curious Frank what kind of changes uh, did you have to make in Commodore to simulate this scenario well basically uh, we allow the and you know the, the the simultaneous transmission so we what we have is like forcing the simulator or forcing the devices to transmit even if the legacy cca mechanism does not allow to do so and you know the idea at the end is to to generate the data set of coordinated transmissions even if we do not uh, directly simulate co-csr Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, that's all the questions that uh, we had. I mean, in fact, as you say, as you say, we look forward to detailed uh, hand-holding roundtable sessions with you. Uh, if I was a participant, I would not miss the opportunity to take Frank's uh, mentoring here. Last year, I know Frank, <laughs> Frank was our top rated mentor, I should say. So we should, uh, you should grab the opportunity to work with Frank. Uh, that's what I would suggest. And also if you look at the paper um, that Frank mentioned, I think there are about five countries or four or five countries who are collaborating who are collaborating for, for that paper. So I think there is a great opportunity right there for the participants. So thank you so much, Frank, for uh, putting up these problem statements. And uh, I hope we have a better time than <laughs> last year. So thank you so much for patiently answering the questions as well. Uh, over to you, Thomas. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Vishnu, uh, for the for handling the Q&A session. I would like to give a very big appreciation to Frank, uh, who took his time to speak to us today in this webinar. 
uh, for preparing the two problem statements uh, in this year's ITU AI and Machine Learning 5G Challenge. I would also like to thank everyone for attending today's session in uh, one of the episodes in the webinar series provided to you by ITU AI and Machine in 5G Challenge. We have more webinar sessions that uh, have been lined out. Please uh, check the information on the challenge website, which we have shared in the chat window, as well as on the uh, AI for Good website, where we have all the events that are lined up. The link is also provided. We are looking forward to seeing you in the next episode of the webinar series next week. Uh, from me and my colleagues at the ITU AI and Machine 5G Challenge, I would like to wish you a good day. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you.